Let's start over. Hi. <laughs> I, want to thank the, I want to thank the folks who pulled this together and for inviting me to participate here. A, a disclaimer, I'm not a history of thought scholar in the way that many of you are, but there are times when I'm wrestling with a problem when I find it really helpful, critically important to, rest, to go back and take a look at what uh, those who preceded us in the profession have had to say about the issues that are important to me. And that's how I ended up backing into a history of thought on the topic before us. What I'm interested in these days is the issue of irreparable, what I call irreparable ignorance. What it is we don't know, not just what we don't know today, but can find out in a relevant time period when we need the information or knowledge. I'm interested in the kind of ignorance that can't be repaired in the time when we need the information or the knowledge to make the decisions we have to confront. I've been writing about this, but let me, I want to give you a little background, and this leads to the problem that I want to discuss today, the problem of the counterfactual in causal analysis. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background because I don't know that many folks here. At the moment, I'm working on a book. It's called The, the Tragedy of Economics, and it's on harm and the harm that economists do as they attempt to do good in the world. So the tragedy, it's a tragedy because I will, I will argue in the book, it can't be overcome, it just has to be managed. And when you, part of the book explores the question, why do economists cause harm when they're trying to do good? And of course, there are many reasons for this. One is the unevenness of economic impact, which economists have written about for well, centuries. And then there's another issue that I take more time in the book to explore, which is the fact that the epistemic condition under which economists operate. We don't know much of what we want to know. We don't know much of what we need to know in order to do much of what we do. I argue that this is irreparable. And with that, I go off and try to explore what are the sources of irreparable ignorance. Um, I, ha I, I have been skeptical uh, about the knowledge claims that are made in economics, I guess, since I started in economics. I published my first book back in 2001. And it's interesting, it, it was, a, it was a, a normative investigation of the debate then raging over, the, let's call it global neoliberalism, a normative investigation. But I mentioned along the way um, in a paragraph that even if we just focused on the positive aspects of the debate, this d debate is still terribly fraught because it engages the issue of causality, which necessarily engages the, the matter of counterfactual reasoning, and yet we can't ever know the counterfactual for reasons I'm going to talk about in a few moments. I, I apparently wrote that back then. I forgot all about it. And then just uh, last year, I, I decided to teach one chapter of the book, and I was rereading it. And there was this claim about counterfactuals. And what was interesting to me is, it's been, I realize now this issue's been in my head for years, uh, but I'd never really taken the time to wrap my mind around it. Over the last year, I decided to change that, and I started to explore this question of the linkage between causality and counterfactual, counterfactual analysis in economics. Um, and that's what I want to present to you here today. I, I apologize for the length of the paper. If you started to take a look at it and you decided, no way, I'm going to put that much time into it, it's a, it's a first cut. It needs to be substantially reduced. It also needs to be sharpened. And then there are people who need to be engaged in that paper who are not there yet. So I really would appreciate any feedback you might have either this weekend or um, in the future. If you can help me sharpen the arguments, I'd be deeply appreciative. All right, now, what I've done in the handout um, is I'm going to make 11 arguments. And I've decided to just give them to you right there in the handout. So if you look at the first page, I'm going to take you through this very quickly and tell you where we're going. And then I'm going to do a little work to actually sustain some of these arguments. Some of these arguments or claims are not controversial. I think some of them are more controversial. So let's take a quick look. The first point, and this is part of what motivates this project, there are, of course, a long list of eminent economists who have engaged the epistemic problem, what we don't know and what we can't know. So if you think about Knight, Shackle, Keynes, and so many others. But there seems to be, to be a presumption, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicitly stated, that there's an epistemic, a sharp epistemic distinction to be drawn between our knowledge of the past and our knowledge of the future. I want to problematize that that presumption. And so the second point is, as concerned one aspect of knowledge, causal relationships, knowing causality, the distinction between the past and the future fails. Third point, the epistemic problem concerning causality involves count the counterfactual problem, which I'll discuss in a moment. Next point, 
all counterfactuals are necessarily fictitious. They're fictions. They're stories about alternative worlds that don't exist. Next claim then is that causal claims that depend on counterfactuals also then must be fictional claims. Um, here's the next problem, point six. There are, in principle, innumerable possible counterfactuals in any complex system, any kind of system that economists are wrestling with. Uh, that then implies that there's a problem. How do we know which counterfactual to choose? My argument is that the problem can be managed, but it can't ever be resolved, despite the determined efforts of methodologists who wrestle with counterfactualizing to, to, rest, to resolve the problem. Next point, we tend to think of methods in economics as an alternative to seeing what is in the world. That's, what we often, that's how we often think about the work we do. I want to suggest that methods in economics might be better theorized as, a, as attempts to see what can't ever be seen, to see what is not. And that's the role of counterfactualizing. The next point is that this argument does not represent a critique or a rejection of counterfactualizing. We cannot survive without it. We do it all the time in our personal lives and in private lives and in our professional work. I want to argue that the, value, the chief value of counterfactuals is not to secure the truth value of causal claims. The value in a world that we can't know and we can't control is to help us envision myriad alternative ways that the world might be and that the white world might go uh, so as to help us better manage the world as it fact, in fact ultimately unfolds. And the last point, I want to argue that the recognition of the problem of the counterfactual the irresolvable problem of the counterfactual represents the strongest case of which I'm aware for pluralism in economics. That's where we're going. Let me, I'm going to say just a few words about some of these propositions. I'm going to say a little bit more about some other of these propositions. But I want to move quickly because um, the arguments are fairly straightforward now that you've seen them. And I'd like to preserve some time to hear your thoughts. All right. Now, of course, in this group, there's no need to belabor the arguments of Keynes, Knight, Shackle. Um, I do want to suggest, as I said, that they draw an epistemic distinction between the past, knowing the past, knowing the future. We see this also in the work of someone like a Deirdre McCloskey, very sharply in the work of Deirdre McCloskey, in fact, who will take the view that th there's so little of importance we can know about the future, but she's very, very confident in what she claims to know about the past. She doesn't claim the epistemic distinction, I would argue she demonstrates it in the way she confronts the past as opposed to the future. Shackle makes the point explicitly that I want to go after here. He says, um, expectation is not rational. But then speaking of the vital fundamental difference between the nature and meaning of the, I'm sorry, I should tell you, after I've given you a bunch of the quotes I'm going to be drawing on in the next few pages. The vital and fundamental difference between the nature and meaning of the content of time past or present and the, time, and the content of time to come was brought into brilliant focus by the Swedish economists Myrtle and Lindell, who evoked the phrase ex ante and ex post to name the two points of view. That of the forward look into the void of unknowledge, of unknowledge, and the backward look into the past with its ascertainable history. That's precisely the epistemic distinction I'm after here between the presumed void of unknowledge as we concern the, as we approach the future and the certainty we expect when knowing the past with its ascertainable history. I take it that this distinction is widely embraced by economists who recognize the epistemic distinction. The intuition, of course, is abundantly clear about the past. We know something about the succession of many events as they unfolded. And we know something about the value of many variables at regular intervals. About the future, we don't know any of those things until, in fact, the future becomes the past. So it's an intuitively plausible idea. But here's the second proposition. As concerns one aspect, one aspect of knowing the past and the future, that is, of causal relationships, the distinction between the past and the future fails. I, um, I, I, I just, uh, economists often typically hope to know the world in order to intervene in it or to stop others from intervening in it in order to bring about beneficial change. That activity entails or requires some knowledge of causal processes, causal path pathways. 
Um, knowing causality requires us more than knowing the succession of events and certainly more than the value of variables, certain variables at regular intervals. It entails some kind of logical connection between distinct events. And knowing that, the logical connection between the events and how they one bleeds into or induces the other, I suggest is just as fraught whether we are specifying linkages in the past or presuming the linkages that will occur in the future. I should add one more thing. The psychologists who focus on the counterfactual problem will argue, several of them, that in fact, knowing the past is even more fraught because of all kinds of biases that we bring to the enterprise, such as cognitive biases, such as the confirmation bias. But I won't be talking about the psychology of the issue. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Third proposition. There's a separate paper, the epistemic problem concerning causality involves the counterfactual problem. Now here, there's really a separate paper. I now realize, which I didn't at the outset, there's a separate paper to be written on how uh, leading economists over the past several centuries, well, political economists and economists have dealt with this issue of causality, defining causality, and the role of counterfactualizing in economics. It's a, more, it's a more vast literature, a richer literature than I've been aware of. I provided very few, but some summaries and citations in the paper ranging from Smith to Hume, Jevons, Hicks, to contemporary theorists like Heckman. Um, but I want to be sure to uh, assure you that I know that I haven't begun to explore the richness of this field in economics, um, and that's work that I think is yet to be done. Um, beyond economics, there is a wonderful contemporary literature, it goes back several decades now, by philosophers, by historians, by political scientists, really trying to probe the relationship between causal claims and uh, counterfactual claims, and in the paper, I just point the reader to uh, some of the literature. The stripped down argument is very simple. It's um, some, if not all, claims involving causal connections between some event X and some other event Y entail a claim about what would have happened in the world had X not happened. If we specify a necessary relationship, a necessary causal relationship between X and Y, then we are clearly making the counterfactual claim that had X not happened, Y could not have happened. No X implies no Y. If we're specifying a relation of sufficiency, then we're claiming that Y would have happened in the presence of X, some causal event X, even absent other events that might have been causal. Or to say it another way, we're presuming that no Y, had Y not happened, X could not have happened. Because if X happens, we know Y is happen, happens. And then, of course, the relation of necessary, necessity and sufficiency entails a very strong counterfactual claim. No X implies no Y, and no Y implies no X. All right, now I said a moment ago that my claim is that some causal claims entail counterfactualizing. I want to be clear, there's a number of, of, of theorists who look at causality who actually go much further than that and claim that all imaginable causal claims entail counterfactual reasoning. Um, I cite Knight in passing here, his notion of the twofold inference involving theorizing policy effects, and I explore Hicks a bit more extensively in the paper. Um, these economists either define causality in counterfactual terms or they give an account that implicitly requires counterfactual claims. And so, for example, here's a quotation by Hicks that I think is in the handout. What then do we mean in terms of the new causality if we assert that A caused B? We will take it that we have satisfactory evidence that both of these events did in fact occur. For causality, we must be maintaining that if A had not existed, B would not have existed. If not A, then not B. But not A and not B are not events which have happened. They are events which have not happened. In recent discussions among historians, they are described as counterfactual. Hicks goes on to claim that, that Adam Smith was a counterfactualizer, as does Eric, the, our, our, our contemporary um, colleague, Eric Schlieser. Among contemporary economists, I think J.J. Heckman has gone furthest in making the claim um, he puts it very simply, uh, as I demonstrate in the epigraph to the paper, science is based on counterfactuals, full stop. 
Human, he goes on to say, human knowledge is based on constructing counterfactuals. Blind empiricism leads nowhere. Elsewhere, he argues, counterfactuals are an ingredient of causal models. He argues that we can't even conceive of causation absent counterfactualization. He says this, a causal relationship is only well-defined if a theory of potential counterfactuals is articulated and a mechanism generating variation is specified. Both steps are pre-statistical and require thought experiments involving counterfactuals in imaginary worlds, end quote. Now, the question, why is this so, if they're right? Or it, why is it so that we see counterfactualizing implicated in causal analysis? And I, I think that you know, the, the, the most famous statement of the problem comes to us from Paul Holland in 1986, what he calls the fundamental problem of causal inference, which many, most of you may know about. The, the problem is that to assert causality, or to ascertain causality, we would need to rerun history many times. We would need to take an agent, individual, community, what have you, take an agent, treat it in some way or other, watch how history unfolds, then rewind the tape, go back to the starting point, everything identical, identical agent under identical circumstances, identical, and this time uh, either introduce a different treatment or introduce no treatment, the control, and see how history might go differently. Here's how Holland puts it. Causal inference is ultimately concerned with the effects of causes on specific units, that is, with ascertaining the value of the causal effect of yt of u minus yc of u, which gives the difference in the value of y, the outcome of unit u under treatment t and the non-treatment c. It is frustrated by an inherent fact of observational life that I call the fundamental problem of causal inference. And here it is. It is impossible to observe the value of yt of u and yc of u on the same unit, and therefore it is impossible to observe the effect of t on u, end quote. The fundamental problem of causal inference. Now, this is where counterfactualizing comes in. Counterfactualizing is a way to manage this problem. It can't resolve the problem. It's a fundamental problem that cannot be resolved. So we have to do our best to manage it. How do we manage it? We manage it by the construction of counterfactuals. We specify what would have happened to a unit that did receive a treatment had it not received the treatment. And we, we hypothesize what would have happened to the unit that did not receive the treatment had it received the treatment. Um, we have to ask ourselves, how would the world have gone differently had the untreated unit been treated and had the untreated unit not been treated? All right, that gets us to the next claim, um, which is recognized, I would argue this next claim has been recognized by many of the most careful theorists who are grappling with the problem of counterfactual, and it is this. All counterfactuals are irreducibly fictitious. This is Heckman's view, as we've just seen when he talked about uh, fant fantasy or imagination, excuse me. Uh, counterfactuals are claims about a world that does not exist, a world that can only we can only inhabit in our imaginations. They are the products of our imagination. They are then fictitious stories or narratives about alternative words, in uh, worlds, excuse me, about alternative worlds. In the paper, I describe them as fantasies to really hammer home the point that that's how insecure they are. They are something we construct in our minds and our imaginations. Next claim, causal claims that depend on counterfactuals then are also irreducibly fictitious. Indeed, if the causal claim can't be made without asserting the counterfactual, and the counterfactual is necessarily fictitious, then so must be the causal claim. Um, I think that Hicks, Heckman, and many other economists I've cited in the paper are correct that causality does entail counterfactualizing. And if counterfactualizing is necessarily fictitious, then so are the, then, then we reach this uncomfortable conclusion that our causal claims are as well. Some speak of the make-believe stories we tell um, with our models, for example, to manage in the world, our counterfactual claim, our causal claims are not based strictly on what we see. They are based equally on fictitious accounts of what we can never see. Proposition six follows. Um, well, not follows, but the prop next proposition. 
as concerns the complex events that economists deal with. So I'm not, I have nothing to say about physics or the natural sciences. But as concerns the complex phenomena that economists engage, there are always, always in principle, innumerable possible and even many plausible counterfactual claims. Alternative counterfactuals may very well conflict with each other, and they often do. And these alternatives may then generate alternative conflicting causal claims. The implication is disturbing for those seeking to ground causal claims in counterfactual claims. And so the question then is, how do we know which counterfactual is the right counterfactual? We need this to sustain the claim that our causal claim is the right causal claim, that our causal claim is correct. Next proposition. At best, this is a problem that can be managed. It cannot be resolved, um, despite the best efforts of methodologists to do so. And I want to talk just a few, uh, few minutes about this. Um, there are, of course, the, the theorists who, who grapple with these issues most carefully, and I, I hope I've cited a good number of them in the paper, recognize the problem that there are always a proliferation of possible counterfactuals, and yet many of them want to hang on to the idea of grounding causation in counterfactualizing. The question then becomes, how do we handle this problem? And the answer is, we devise methods for proper counterfactualizing. And there are a number of criteria that now are present, presented in the literature that purport to teach us how to derive to generate a, a dependable counterfactual, and criteria, excuse me, criteria for assessing counterfactuals that have been offered by others. I want to just take you through two of these very two of these criteria. Um, I want to suggest to you that they are deeply problematic. They are interpreted in diverse ways, each of them, such that they lead to contradictory uh, results, and there is often inconsistency among them. So the first one is quite intuitive. It can be thought of as the consistency with historical facts criterion, that if you're going to be specifying some counterfactual narrative, you should stick as closely as you can to the actual facts of the world when you insert your false antecedent that, let's say, x did not happen, or some x that did not happen did, in fact, happen. This is specified in many different ways. Um, this is specified in the closest world framework of Lewis and Stalnaker. It's it's specified in the plausible world's approach of Hawthorne. It's specified in the minimal rewrite rule. It's specified in static and dynamic models of closeness and so forth. The point, there is a, a, a tremendous, not tremendous, but there is a significant range of alternative specifications of what historical consistency is taken to mean. And in fact, some of them conflict with each other, and some of them are explicitly offered as correctives to the others. So for example, if you take a look at the paper, uh, Elster offers the dynamic approach to closeness as a correction to the lewis Stalnaker static approach to closeness, and the views then conflict. All right, making matters worse for this criterion, not only is it specified in different ways that disagree with each other, many theorists reject it altogether and introduce the idea that there are often important reasons to introduce what are called miracle causes into our counterfactual stories. These are, um, these are false antecedents that could not possibly have happened in the context of history. The idea is that sometimes it makes sense to do that so as to test propositions that we take to be true today. So um, I don't remember what examples I give in the paper. Had the, it's, it's implausible that MMT as it exists now could have existed in that context. Hence, uh, it's a miracle cause. The point in doing it is not is to test MMT against the conditions that existed in the 1920s into the 1930s. But there's a fundamental problem here with miracle causes. How are we to distinguish between miracle causes that are taken to be legitimate and useful for generating information knowledge and, how are we, and those that are taken to be useless? The critics are merciless on this point. So for example, here's the example that's often given. Had, uh, had Napoleon had nuclear weapons at Waterloo, he would have prevailed. <laughs> Perfectly true. But it's, it's widely taken to be a relatively useless counterfactual. It gives us no useful information about the world as it was then or the world as it is now. That then raises the question then, what's the criteria for distinguishing between useful and useless miracle cause counterfactuals? 
On this question, as you can anticipate, there is nothing but disagreement among the, method the counterfactual methodologists. There are other problems here um, that I, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll leave it alone. Well, let me just, th th this is important, so let me just stay on this for one more, one more moment. Think about the problem of the historical consistency criterion. If we were, if we were laying out this kind of a counterfactual, um, uh, ha, the, the, the false antecedent would be Donald Trump, yeah, Donald Trump loses the election in 2016. Okay. If we want to specify, that's a perfectly good a false antecedent to then conduct a thought experiment about what, how the world would have gone with absent Trump and instead with Hillary Clinton. Now think about what the historical consistency criterion requires of us when we specify that. When we specify that he lost rather than that he won, we then have to change all the elements in the world or those elements in the world that we think would be necessary for him to have won. So for example, one might claim that Hillary Clinton would have had to be male rather than female in order for Donald Trump to win. Or you might say the Russians would not have been, would have not, would have had to, would have had to refrain from interference for Trump to win. Or you might argue economic policy for the previous three decades would have had to been different for Trump not to win. And we immediately see the problem. There are innumerable specifications of what would have had to change in order for the false antecedent, Trump loses the election, to be true. And now here's the problem. How do we know which one of those is the right one? What's the right counterfactual? Knowing that requires that we have tremendous knowledge about the causal processes in our world. But counterfactualizing is intended to help us discover the causal processes. We have a circularity problem here. We already need to know what we want to know before we can specify the, the counterfactual, which will then let us know what we want to know. It, this problem is inescapable. And this becomes even more apparent with the second criteria of counterfactualizing. And you'll see the problem as soon as I mention it to you. It's the theoretical consistency criterion. And this argument goes that when you, specify, when you introduce a false antecedent into your narrative, you have to stick with, however, the laws that are known to be true or that we have good reason to know to be true when you then tease out your counterfactual. But we don't, at least in the social sciences, we don't know. There are two problems here. One is there aren't unimpeachable causal laws. We fight to the death with each other over what they might be. We don't agree, and rightly. And number two, the circularity problem is even stronger here. You need to stick to the known theories in order to derive the right counterfactual, but counterfactualizing is supposed to give us the key to learning what are, in fact, the causal laws. This argument, this problem, is recognized even by the most careful of the methodologists who offer the criterion at the same time they offer it. So I'm thinking of people like Tetlock and Belkin, Philip Tetlock and Belkin. They're very good about this. They say, here are our criteria. Let me show you why, in fact, these are so problematic in the social sciences. Next proposition. We tend to think cause, ca casually of research methods in economics as alternative means of seeing what is. I suggest that they're better theorized as attempt attempts to see what cannot be seen ever, to see what is not. Um, the, I, the argument here is that all the methods we derive to hunt causality really are trying to help us figure out which is the right counterfactual. And I think this helps to explain why we are always at loggerheads, because we can never see the counterfactual. The, the, the space for disagreement is infinite. The likelihood of collapse into one way of making sense of the world is very, very slim. Because what we're throwing into the arena are not just our different accounts of what is. We're throwing into the arena our alternative accounts of worlds that don't exist. And on that, there are you know, only our imaginations limit us in terms of throwing up candidates into the arena. Um, Heckman, speaking of economic modeling, says the economic econometric. So, uh, in the paper, I'm not going to do it here. In the paper, I then go through different economic methodologies to show why it is that each of them is really about specifying correctly what is the true counterfactual, so that we can infer true causation. Because John Davis is here, I'll just I'll just go turn to where's John? I'll just turn to John. Uh, with respect to simulation methods, he, here's what John has to say. Simulation methods construct artificial worlds that resemble and imitate real worlds, and consequently they compare what could be 
what could be the case in terms of how that artificial world is microspecified with what could be the case in resulting macrostructural terms were the real world to closely resemble the artificial world. I won't go through the rest of the quote, but you get the point. And I think John's right, which is why I'm making the claim here. I think that simulations are a beautiful tool for helping us to think through what might be the uniquely correct counterfactual. But so are all, all the other approach, method, not all, but the other methodologies in economics, axiomatic deductive reasoning, uh, um, econometric testing, and so on and so forth. They should probably be thought of as attempts to see what can't be seen, the counterfactual, so that we can then infer causality. Point nine, I'm going to go through this really fast now. This argument does not represent a critique, and I hope it doesn't sound that way. This is not a critique of counterfactualizing. We can't live without counterfactualizing. If we need to be making causal claims, we need counterfactualizing. So to say that counterfactuals are fictitious is not to indict them. If you think about science fiction, in good science fiction, we're provoked to think about our own world and ourselves differently, and we learn lessons from the comparison that we might not learn as well without the counterfactualizing. That's what a good counterfactualizing, good counterfactual does. It opens up our minds to uh, new insights that we might not achieve as quickly or as well without it. Proposition 10. The value of counterfactuals then is not to secure a truth. The truth value of, or, 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 the assertive, or the assertability, for that matter, of causal claims. The value in a world we can't know and can't control is to help us envision myriad alternative ways that the world may be and might go so that we can do better to prepare. I just want to draw on a couple of folks here who I think really have nailed this. One is Steve Weber. He says, the, the diversity of ideas is a survival asset for a human society living in an uncertain environment with an uncertain future. Because innovation can be slow, idea diversity acts as a repository of alternative solutions and action plans that people can call upon if they need them. And this leads to the last point. I think this is a, this, understanding the role of counterfactuals and the value that they actually provide to us presents a very strong argument for pluralism in economics. After all, what do alternative theoretical perspectives do? They help us to generate alternative competing counterfactuals that open up our minds, if we're willing to listen to them, open up our minds to the alternative ways that the world might be and could go so that we do a better job as a profession, economists, helping society to prepare for an uncertain, unknowable future. I end with this lovely poem by the Nobel laureate, uh, Vyslava Shamborska. It's nothing twice. And I'm just going to give you the, the, uh, it's the, I think it's one of the epigraphs to the paper. It, the poem begins this way. She says, nothing can ever happen twice. In consequence, the sorry fact is that we arrive here improvised and we leave without the chance to practice. Mm -hmm. I think that is a perfect statement of where we are in economics. It's not an indictment of economics. It's an argument that if were we to recognize this and the useful role that counterfactuals can play, we would do a much better job in serving those we purport to serve. Thank you. Please, I'm sorry, I'll, we're, I'll we're go gonna, this way no, and then I'll Actually, we're going to run the, the questions from oh, up here. Oh, please do, please do. Carlos, why don't you start while I get myself positioned over here. So this side is on me, that side is on Ross. So hands up here on this side. Should I go? I, George, I, I like your topic. I think there's a tension in what you're doing. You emphasize the constructive nature of counterfactualizing, yeah. but then you sometimes descend into irreparable ignorance if Napoleon had had uh, nuclear weapons. So go to the psychology literature first and, for example, look at Kahneman and Verry's, uh, yeah. Carol Verry's 19, 1990 article on close counterfactuals. Yeah. So close counterfactuals, the possible worlds that are close to us, that's where the causal analysis of behavior is being worked out. So I think that's the, the first uh, recommendation. The second recommendation is that, well, take, if we take modus ponens as our, if P then QP is true, therefore Q is true, is our fundamental model, you should look at what the philosophers say in the classic example, if Oswald hadn't killed Kennedy, mm -hmm. then Some someone else, else did. Right. Well, we'll take it as a fact that Oswald killed Kennedy, though it's controversial, right? And so we have a false premise, which is uh, creates a valid inference that someone mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. would have killed Kennedy. So there's information there violating the requirements of modus ponens. Mm -hmm. so, well, actually, the more interesting thing is that we're not really quite sure that 
uh, Oswald killed Kennedy. We think he, we take it as a fact. So the point about the past is, uh, this goes to your uh, irreducibly fictitious point, is that we're really not exactly sure what the facts are. Facts are relatively settled for, uh, in a social fashion, but they're still uh, controversial. So the, the boundaries are not quite as sharp sometimes yep. as you say. Good. Thanks. Thank you. On the first one, the problem here is this. Close counterfactuals. You can imagine two worlds. You imagine any two worlds, uh, unless you are the one doing it. Well, imagine two worlds. Um, they may very well be alike in multiple respects, but different in multiple respects. So when we then have a measure of closeness, we've got to sift through the differences and the, 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 the various differences and similarities or identities and figure out of all the possible alternative worlds, which one is closest. That requires theoretical work. That depends on counterfactualizing. That's so the not, problem doesn't. That's not what a close counterfactual is. It's where there is identifiably one fundamental thing. By just studying the extra chapter, I would have done better on this. Thing. Yeah. That's what a close counterfactual is. It's a very almost if scenario, which is fundamental. So we identify well, one, one change. This happens all the time. If the bus didn't come, it's because. But I don't think sorry. it happens all the time in economics. Is the point? It doesn't happen. I don't think it happens all the time in complex systems of the sort that we are apt to investigate. But I, but that said, I'm not going to argue the point any further. I will really. I'll take. I'll take you up on those suggestions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed the talk. I think this uh, this point that. Uh, we can't know for sure uh, causal relations of the past. Right? We take it for granted we can't understand the future, uh, but similar problems plague our understanding of the past. Uh, on, on some level, I felt like I understood that, but, but seeing it put so concretely and then seeing the arguments laid out, I feel like I have to approach problems differently now, <laughs> now going forward. Uh, so I, I thought that was great. I, I have a couple of suggestions uh, uh, about the rhetorical presentation of the argument. You give examples, but one example that came to mind as soon as you posed that, that problem was the Great Depression. We are still arguing today right. about uh, the causes of the Great Depression and the factors that got us out of it. And it seems to me that that might be a very powerful anchoring example for I, I, a lot of the arguments that you want to make, right? These, these. Uh, I agree with you that this is a very powerful argument in favor of pluralism, uh, but I don't think that comes out strongly enough in the, in the paper itself. You've got a little paragraph about it midway through. It's a little okay. bit buried. I would bring that up front. And then the last comment is a little bit connected to what John said. I felt your ending was a little, uh, I say this with love, George. I thought it was a little wishy-washy. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you say that it helps us imagine different worlds and help us to better manage the world. But you know, we can only better manage the world unless we have some understanding of causal mechanisms. So we need to have criteria for, for establishing those, those causal mechanisms, even as we understand that, that the process is rife with, with problems. Uh, and the last point I would make is that, as I was thinking about that, it occurred to me that maybe there's a connection between what you're arguing towards the end and David Colander's idea that economic policy is an art, not a science, yeah, that there's, you, mm -hmm. it, there are judgment calls. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so George, I really love uh, the challenge that you put on history, the fact that we may not know history just like we may not know the future. Just pull, it a little, just and, pull that a little closer, listen, I think. Um, and in part, like Gary, I think that the fact that history has been interpreted in many different ways uh, is an evidence that support your case. Right. Even things that may sound less controversial than the Great Depression, but if you say, if you look at the same events, um, the, 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 if you look at the same events yes. from one 
author to another, yes. you have very different interpretation. I'm exactly. looking at history written by winners as opposed to the same history written by non-winners sure. give you very different exactly. uh, ways of, of understanding uh, or presenting the same history. Um, what I thought was also fascinating is, and I'm not sure uh, how to handle this, um, jurisprudence, especially in terms of Roman law. Because yeah. my understanding is a development of Roman law was done through counterfactuals. And I was, I was wondering how uh, that would fit in your story. Um, I, well, of course, I don't know, because I, but now you've told me where to look. What's fascinating to me, because the book I'm writing is actually on harm. This is just one piece of it. And in jurisprudence, harm, the, the predominant approach to harm specification, the actual definition of harm is a counterfactual definition. It's comparing how a, there's an event, a person, an agent, an event that may or may not be harmful, and then the person after the event. So before the event and after. Two ways to go here. One is a historical approach. You compare how the person was before the event with how they are immediately after. Um, and if they've, if they've deteriorated, they've been harmed. But that doesn't get very far when it comes to things like stunting, when someone isn't immediately harmed by not being able to go to school, but their life then goes in a different direction from the way it would have gone had they been able to go to school. And so many harm theorists in, juris in the legal tradition embrace the counterfactual approach because we do want to know how a person's life went after an event with how it did go, with how it might have gone after the event. So it's, it's, it's impl counterfactualizing is implicated in how we even define harm, which I, I, I think is, well, for me, I think it's fascinating to come to kind of encounter this. I'll ask you more later about the Roman law. That would be great for me to know more about it. OK. Um, I'm a bit confused by <clears throat> your definition of counterfactual. As a matter of fact, I don't think you gave a definition of counterfactual. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Because um, my understanding of counterfactual is a proposition, what would have happened to Europe had Napoleon won a Waterloo? Or yes. a more familiar case, what would happen to American economy had the railways not been invented? You know, that's, that's, uh, that's a proposition that I understand as counterfactual. Causality, so counterfactual by definition is a sort of thought experiment mm -hmm. which is timeless. You, you don't invoke the time. Well, uh, yeah. sorry. Okay. While causality is typically a time relationship, you cannot have causality unless something comes before of the event that you want to mm -hmm. explain. <clears throat> okay. And then there is a third type of relationship, which is typical in mathematics. If uh, x, then y. Uh, and this yeah. is timeless. Okay, it's mm -hmm. not causality. It's just a logical relationship that mm -hmm. is said to exist. Okay, mm -hmm. if x then y. Mm -hmm. So and and finally there is a third or fourth, if you want, definition. And I'm following up what uh, Maria P has just said. By definition, historical explanations are multiple. There's never one causes, and. Whoever does historical works knows that there are many causes, mm -hmm. and very while the counterfactual is just one particular event description mm -hmm. that is used as a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. So I don't, uh, well, maybe mm -hmm. I didn't understand properly. I don't see how you put all the causality uh, thing into a counterfactual. Mm -hmm. They seems to me to different type theoretically to different conceptual mm -hmm. environment. And uh, I just want to give you an example from my own work. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a paper on causality on Monday. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> on, on Zrafa on causality. Mm -hmm. And uh, following up some work that uh, John and I have done in the past. <clears throat> And uh, just to give you an example of what I mean in the difference between a counterfactual and an experiment, okay? Mm -hmm. Amartya a Sen and an experiment. An experiment, okay? Yes, uh, Amartya Sen mm -hmm. uh, said that what Rafa is about is about counterfactual, and that's why it, it, he was uh, so much opposed to neoclassical economics because he was opposed to counterfactual proposition of the type. Uh, 
I have argued, and I will argue, that this is a different story, because what Rafa says is that when you try to make the experiment of adding one unit of a factor to find out the marginal productivity of the factor, this is not a counterfactual. This is an actual experiment that you can actually make. The only difference is that you're not measuring what the theory said you will be measuring, because you cannot find out exactly the causal element mm -hmm. in the end factor. You know, as a matter of fact, it was Robertson who said, if you add an 11 worker to the 10 worker already mm -hmm. working, maybe he just went and buy beer for everybody. <laughs> so everybody was happier. Mm -hmm. And that's so you're measuring the average product, not mm -hmm. the value. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that uh, thought experiment or experiment that can actually be made in order to prove a particular theory need not to be necessary counterfactual. So well, I, I, maybe I did understand properly. I should have to, I will have to read your paper mm -hmm. to see how, you know, you make this argument. But it seems to me that you use counterfactual in a too broad okay, sense that yeah. I would, uh, I would accept. Yeah, very good. Um, I, in the paper, I do define counterfactual, and I, if, if you have a chance to take a look at it, I would be so appreciative if you were to, to uh, that piece of it, I would be so appreciative to hear your thoughts. I mean, counterfactual, the definition that's used widely and that I, I accept for my purposes is a, a false antecedent, a false, ante, you know, Napoleon winning the war, uh, winning at Waterloo, with a, subju a subjunctive conditional what would have happened next, which is why it's different from the indicative con uh, conditional that you just gave us a minute ago. We know that Kennedy was killed. If Oswald didn't do it, we think he did, then somebody else did it. That's not a, that's not a, counterfactual, that, that's not a counterfactual of the sort I'm in, uh, pursuing here because there's an indicative conditional, somebody else did it. Um, so that's how it's defined. With respect to, uh, you've said so many things that I now I wanna talk to you about. With respect to an experiment, if the experiment is trying to, if the experiment is trying to ascertain uh, causality, then the counterfactual problem is inescapable. Because that agent on whom the experiment is conducted either is treated or that, that agent is not treated. If that agent is treated, we're making a comparison with how his, his or her life went against how his or her life would have gone had the intervention not been made on that agent we won't ever know, because as soon as that agent got the treatment, the alternative world not getting the treatment goes away, and now all we can do is speculate about it. And so what do we do? We run up the numbers. We do the experiment on 1,000 people with 500 in the treatment group, 500 in the control, and we convince ourselves that that gives us, that gives us insight into the counterfactual we know we treated this group, we see the outcome, the average outcome, we know we treated that, we didn't treat that group. We can then specify, we think, that had someone in the treatment group not been in the treatment group and instead had been in the, that, that, or that group as a whole, they would have reacted the way the control group did. That's a counterfactual exercise because we can't ever know. So it's, a, it's an, an attempt to manage the counterfactual. It can't eliminate the problem of the counterfactual if the experiment is trying to test causality. That's, so that's the only little rejoinder to the last part. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think you have made a nice case for why economics needs philosophy, so that's great. Um, uh, let me ask two questions. So one is whether you could say something more about your uh, claim number eight. So how would that look like, those methods that you're suggesting. So how would that changing perspective change the methods that we use in economics in order to... Good. Yeah? So that's the first question. Okay. Uh, and the second question is also, again, to ask you to say a little bit more, and I'll read your paper, but if you could say something now about what you exactly mean by pluralism in economics. So, and here I'm thinking, well, th there are... Uh, philosophers who basically argue for this pluralism in methods in order to be able to actually uh, get to have uh, to well to make causal claims. Uh, so one of them would be, for instance, probabilistic uh, and, uh, and and an existence of a mechanism that we would be able to identify in order to be able to make a causal claim. Mm -hmm. So 
what exactly do you mean by pluralism in this case? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, the, the first uh, question, how would, how would methods change? I'm not sure methods would change. What would change are the claims that we make for the findings that those methods derive. We would be more attentive to the fact that what we really are trying to explore is the counterfactual. This is something we cannot know. And the, the effort here is to be much more humble about the claims that the theoretical claims, the causal claims that we make. I don't think it changes the doing of RCTs necessarily. It certainly asks us to be more mindful, uh, to be less uh, confident about the conclusions of the RCT, not just for the community where it was undertaken, but for its applicability somewhere else, because that involves yet another counterfactual that had this. Uh, policy been that was pursued here in this trial had had been pursued there, and it would have generated the same results. So much greater uh, awareness of the limitations of the to the causal claims we make. But I don't know that it makes any difference in how we go about doing economics. I I, I hadn't even thought of the question until you just asked it. So I, I need to now think about that. Um, sorry, the, pluralism. I, you know, I am. I, um, uh, if you, have, if you pressed me to define myself as an economist, I'd have to say that I'm a post-structuralist Marxist. What the hell does that mean, right? But it means I'm marginalized in my profession. Um, and, and so I've always looked at the profession as, um, uh, as a, as a um, filtering mechanism that eradicates ideas that are hostile to or contrary to a mainstream theory, and I've, n I've never been quite sure why there was such hostility around this issue of alternative methods, alternative ways of thinking. And by the way, this may be going away in today's econo young among young economists, but the older economists, and I've now come to conclude that the problem is this. The problem that, a, that multiple theoretical positions entail in economics is that alternative theoretical frameworks, Keynes, Marx, feminist economics, social economics, institutionalists, and on and on, generate contradicting counterfactuals, and that undermines the confidence or the authority of the causal claims that appear within the mainstream of the profession. And I think that's why this fight over pluralism has been so intense, because it undermines, yeah, well, I'll just keep repeating myself. I think that we need these alternative stories. So by, I wasn't talking about methods so much, but I think we need many alternative methods. I was thinking more of theoretical frameworks, because the, the theoretical frameworks are what allow us to specify what the counterfactual would be. And we need a proliferation of those counterfactuals. It's really dangerous when we uh, converge on one dominant counterfactual. Uh, we will, are almost certainly going to be wrong. And when we talk to the world as if we know that that is the right counterfactual, we lead, we lead society down, a, it, 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 down the, a primrose path. So uh, George, um, I'd like to welcome you to the community of radical skeptics. Our, our conferences yes. are small and desolate, yeah. and we don't get along very well, but uh, you're welcome to join. Um, I'm going to actually outdo Christina. She's going to send you a paper. I'm going to send you a whole book. Okay. So, um, what is it? Is it yours? We're, we're, yes, we're working, we're working in, in um, related areas here. I, your, your talk raised a lot of questions um, that I have that maybe we can talk about another time. Um, and I'm not even sure what, which, uh, which question I want to ask you here. Well, let me, let me start with the first, probably most obvious point for me. Um, the, your last uh, uh, thesis, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't see that the, that certainly pluralism doesn't follow, right, from the fact, if it is a fact that uh, counterfactual, uh, you know, um, we can't acquire a knowledge of causality via counterfactual reasoning. I um, mean, that's just an is-ought thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, if that's a fact, uh, why, would, uh, mm -hmm. why would nihilism not mm -hmm. also be an alternative, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, so in other words, I, yeah. I think that okay. I think your argument can be a premise in an argument for pluralism, yeah. but pluralism doesn't follow from it. Um, and so I guess maybe I'll just ask the question that everybody would expect me to ask. Where's Hayek here? Yeah, I know. Because um, Hayek, Hayek is the, I mean, this is part of the reason that I'm going to send you the book, because Hayek is, of all the people that you mention, Hayek is by far the most epistemologically sophisticated. Right. Uh, and so to not have him, I think, is, you know, there's, he's an ally here for you. I, thank you. I, I, of course, if this paper becomes what it is not now, 
which is, this paper is not a serious treatment of the history of economic thought on this issue of, of counterfactualism. I didn't enter that, the project in that way, and I didn't produce it. Were I to do that, of course, Hayek has to be front and center. And moreover, no matter what I do with this paper, I, I've in, I intend very soon to immerse myself again in Hayek to see what I can take out of this, for, absolutely for sure. The last claim is absolutely a normative claim. Proposition 11, and I agree, it doesn't, it doesn't follow as a, a logical necessity, it follows as a moral, it, but there is a moral urgency, in my mind, to pluralism because of the insights that preceded. I, I need to then sharpen that, thank you. Um, thank you, the, um, that was wonderful. Uh, for those who don't, don't know, the first paper I heard George give was on Calder Hicks, and Calder Hicks, although economists don't like it, think about this, is a strong commitment to possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And so possible compensation is modal. And that nobody goes to, or I just don't know anybody who's gone to the trouble of saying, well, which system, right? There's a lot of them out there. And so with counterfactuals, yeah, it's modal. Of course it's modal. Um, so that, that's, that's good. Um, but there's another way. and. That may be, it may be closer to what we routinely do, but let me, let me lay it out. And that is, there's a book that I don't think anybody, it, it's long been forgotten. It's, it's Rutledge Vining's last book. He, he wrote it, I think it's 1982. Um, there's a lot of correspondence with Buchanan about as it's going through the process. And basically the problem is, how do we evaluate, how do we do normative evaluations when we've got a stochastic process? And so, if, so the idea is if we run it once, we're gonna get one sort of outcome. We run it another time, we're gonna get a different sort of outcome because it is stochastic, how about that? So how do we evaluate that? Now Buchanan takes the tack that we need to think about processes in terms of rules, not outcomes. Because the outcome is going to be implementation dependent or something like mm -hmm. that. So that there is a, um, there's a, so, this, so there's a connection with the kind of stuff that you want to, you're talking about the literature, you're studying it, but it's also in the Vining Buchanan School, okay. which seems to have a way, I mean, a way of avoiding modal, sort of the modal issues. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there just seems to avoid the modal issues. But I think that would be something that to, okay. Very good. To, 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 to think through seriously. And that the, I suspect, although I haven't done the details, I suspect this is just a continuation of the Vining Koopman stuff. And, and and that um, one of the strangest things from a public choice point of view is that in the vining Koopmans debate, Koopmans is the one that defends methodological individualism. Mm -hmm. Vining is defending methodological holism. And that maybe the methodological holism is a way that sort of the counterfactual gets smuggled in. All right, that may be the sort of that may be sort of the move that people mm -hmm. haven't haven't seen. But it came as a shock when I went back and read that stuff. Is Vining is a methodological individualist? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, Kuhnman is, yeah. and and Vining, and so that this is the really odd part of the debate. It surprises, but maybe maybe there's a counterfactual stuff that's in that package. It's going to take a long time. To work out, but I think this I think this is wonderful, wonderfully interesting stuff. And I, I, okay. I, I mentioned I talk about I talked to George at breakfast, and I, I mentioned that I read a for odd reasons I, I was reading something by Saul Kripke, and and Kripke was quoting Nozick, and Nozick is saying, "Gee, the, com, we could replace comparative statics with counterfactuals. The counter the comparative statics, if we think that way, is just a an infinitesimal away from the actual, right? And so this is a this is sort of the way of economy. The standard move is to get things close, is to make all our moves from actual infant only infinitesimal steps. But thanks very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, George. Thank you all. No, thank, thank you all.